to the um, welcome everybody to the March um, edition of the business models community discussions and today we're going to be talking about working with artisans and we've got two wonderful speakers um, Rania Salah Sadiq and uh, Ronald Tumuherwe. Um, Rania is from Gebra in Egypt and Ronald is from Motive in Uganda. And I'm going to ask them to, in a moment, to just introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their work, particularly focusing on the work they do with artisans. Um, and um, we're going to open up the discussion, um, invite you to share your experiences, um, questions, comments, all this kind of thing. Um, so we hope to have a very interactive discussion about this today. So thank you again to our speakers for, for agreeing to share with us today. And uh, Rania, if I could hand over to you to just give a brief introduction first, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, um, actually, uh, like, uh, like I can uh, speak. So, I mean, I mean, uh, please interrupt me anytime because I can just like, ooh, you know, I'm ADHD person, so I can just speak. So please ask questions, interrupt me, stop me whenever you feel uh, like. And please, Anna, if I take too long, please stop me. So uh, my name is Rania. I'm the founder of uh, both Gibra and Karama. I'm here by the invitation of Omar Safti. He's my uh, like uh, amazing friend from Egypt who started, who was actually involved from, you know, you know more about Omar than I do, like all the makerspace uh, um, work in Egypt uh, has been in, involved in it from the beginning, Fab Lab. Um, we're doing something different, but we found uh, like uh, intersections and how we can um, collaborate uh, together. We're working mainly on reviving, um, rev revitalizing uh, traditional Egyptian uh, crafts. Our main goal is to transfer knowledge of uh, last generation who's uh, actually inherited it for so many years, thousands of years from the generations before. To, to to help it be transferred to the new generation who doesn't want to learn anything. And, and hence the craftsmanship is literally dying. Uh, so we work through a for-profit and non-for-profit. The for-profit is mainly uh, aiming to increase the demand through a product innovation and penetrating new markets. And the non-profit is aiming to increase the supply through the knowledge transfer, um, through uh, apprenticeship programs and, and, and trainings. Uh, so we started first with Gebra uh, to um, to increase the demand, and when it started to kick um, to, to kick out, I don't know. Um, uh, and actually, not only us, but uh, the whole country. You know, like generally, when something is dying, lots of people come uh, into place and try to help it out. So now the the position in Egypt is better regarding the traditional handicrafts. Uh, it's better, like, it's better in the area of um, marketing and uh, sales, but it's not yet better in the area of knowledge transfer. And uh, that's why we also started a nonprofit to, to focus on the knowledge transfer. And that's basically what we do. And we're, we're, um, I'm gonna, like, we, we can, uh, afterwards, I'll talk about how this is connected to the Fab Lab and the maker spaces and the makers in general and the, the relationship to artisans. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Rania. You, um, Ronald, if I could ask you to, to give a brief introduction to yourself and Motive and the Virtual Factory Network as well, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ronald and uh, I work with Motive. Motive is a local makerspace in Uganda, um, focusing on supporting creatives in the sectors of textiles, woodwork, metalwork, uh, food and nutrition, and also media. Uh, so Motive created an in initiative called the Virtual Factory Network, which is focused on supporting cottage industries within the community. Uh, by helping yeah. them out uh, solve the most challenges that they have, but then also promoting uh, decentralized manufacturing because most of them um, didn't have capacity 
to be able to supply huge orders. And so Motive stepped in with this initiative uh, to be able to support uh, these artisans. And I, I think I'll be sharing more on the type of support and how it's being implemented as we move on. Yeah, thanks. That, that's great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm interested already in the um, slight differences in, in what you've talked about that, um, Rania, you put emphasis on um, the skills and how these are, are dying out. Um, and it sounds like the knowledge transfer is a big part of what you um, are focusing on. Um, whereas Ronald, um, I think from what I've understood of with the virtual factory network, you put a bit more emphasis on things like access to inputs and access to market and so on. Um, so, I just wonder if you could just expand a little bit on that first, Urania, on the type of support you offer, why you think it's important, why it's necessary. Um, actually, although this is what we want to do, but we're uh, it's all um, like if you want to do knowledge transfer, you need uh, lots of investment and you need lots of capital. So um, um, uh, we 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 either like we're generally working only as Gibra. But uh, through the last, uh, from 2019 to 2021, we had a uh, large funding where we were allowed to, um, to uh, try uh, um, the knowledge transfer process with different uh, um, groups that we have found uh, are the ones who can take the knowledge forward. Um, we basically, of course, started with the, uh, not start, we ended with the, the ones in mind, the, the vocational training uh, students, technical school students, uh, and they've proven amazing um, discipline, uh, skill, quality. I don't know, like the working with youth is generally very refreshing uh, and energizing. And they've been amazing working, uh, working with them. And we're trying, we didn't do apprenticeship. This would be a, a, a phase two of the project, but we, we started with in school, training for them uh, and uh, we had a training had um, um, a protocol with the ministry of uh, uh, education as well as a protocol with the best uh, training school in uh, in town with the traditional craft which is actually prince charles school of traditional arts um, and uh, uh, the trainers were amazing they worked with different people they didn't only work with the uh, technical schools uh, kids but they also worked with community school where um, they live in an uh, informal, non-formal uh, settlement, let's call it. And the community school is a new um, uh, system of uh, schools in Egypt where kids go to school both to work and to learn. Uh, so it's an, a, a, a normal school, but they have to earn their living uh, or they get paid. So we also uh, train the kids there, as well as uh, training kids, and this is our new project as well, with uh, kids with mental, um, with intellectual disabilities. Uh, in Egypt, um, we have a huge uh, problem of knowledge transfer because uh, kids don't want to learn. Why don't they want to learn? Because it's um, it's boring to learn uh, um, traditional craftsmanship. It's also, it's like we have the tuk-tuk. I don't know if you know the tuk-tuk. The tuk-tuk is the main uh, uh, threat. Uh, uh, they 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 earn much more from tuk tuks. It's much more fun for them. They are seen. They are like the, the they make noise in the streets. They can harass girls in the street. They can turn music on. They can uh, like make favors for their friends and go. Uh, you know, like uh, like they are powerful with their tuk tuks. Um, and that is something that uh, actually is crime. <laughs> It, it increased the crime rate. It doesn't only like, yeah, it's important to have tuk-tuks and to have rides in small, in small streets, but um, it, it kills industry. It kills industry, it kills agriculture, and it kills manufacturing in general in Egypt. Now we don't have young kids who want to learn anything that is of a career path. So um, that's why we also worked with the um, um, intellectual disability kids, not because uh, they are intellectually disabled, but because they are of advantage to us wheelchair people and intellectual uh, dis uh, dis uh, differently abled people in general are of advantage to us. They are not gonna ride tuk-tuks. They are either wheelchaired 
who have time to work on something as boring or let's call it boring for some, but it's not boring, like that needs high level of accuracy, high level of focus, high level of uh, attention and quality uh, and, ha and have more time, have more time to give, have uh, uh, passion to, to do, so. they want opportunities. And that's why we wanted to focus on both the intellectual, uh, uh, the intellectual disability kids and the wheelchair uh, youth. And they've done amazing work. And now we're actually in our process of starting a new project with them. We've worked with them on the inlay craft. The inlay craft is um, is actually the most difficult uh, uh, art, um, craftsmanship because it includes a lot of uh, different uh, materials and its supply chain is very long and it requires a very high skill. So now we're 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 gonna work with them on us uh, on. Um, piercing and model making out of uh, something like clay uh, gibson i don't know oh, fantastic that's yeah. that's so interesting thank you um ronald can i ask in in uganda do you recognize the issue that rani has been talking about of young people not wanting to go into the traditional crafts or into manufacturing is that also an issue that you see i mean yeah it's definitely true because most of the times uh People, people are really looking at it as a blue collar jobs. It's something as in, uh, if someone drops out of school, that's like the last alternative they can take on. Um, but however, I, I, I do, based on research, it's uh, due to COVID, the effects of COVID, it showed that uh, people, let's say, who have white collar jobs or corporate jobs, they, they started losing their jobs in finance, in different sectors and banking. So. Now what they really depended on is what can I do with the skills maybe my mom taught me, what can I do with my hands? So that so that brought to a rise of cottage industry. And I, based on what we are seeing at the makerspace, uh, the mindset of people is changing that um, being an artisan, it does not really mean that I've failed in school. So this is the last alternative but it is a skill that I can enhance and be able to generate more money for my family. And also like, so that right now, that's why we even have like programs at the Makerspace whereby uh, parents bring in their school, uh, their children, they, they, they want them to learn how to make bracelets. They want them to learn how to make basic furniture. So um, I do I do agree with Rania on, on, that, on that, but then, based on COVID and the effects that it brought, people have really started in embracing it. Now we are seeing more people going into the creative sector. Uh, there's more funding in the in the in the in that sector. And even the government itself has uh, created an industrial park uh, designated to production of um, textile products um, in terms of construction. So it's really starting to engage people into the manufacturing sector and also enhancing the creativity of uh, of people. So yeah, that's my take on it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite anyone else, any of our other participants to, to please join in the conversation too. I'm curious ab about this issue and whether you recognize it in um, the countries that you're from. Um, I, um, Martin, I know that you work a lot on um, with the Juakali in, in Kenya, but I also just see that Nan's put her hand up. So I'll go to Nan first, and then I'm going to come and, and ask you afterwards, Martin. Nan. Sorry, just unmuting. Um, a couple of things here that uh, that I've picked up on. Um, the, there's, there seems to be points about um, the uh, revival of dying skills um, which is is traditional knowledge um, and there's also points about um, how one could uh, increase manufacturing um, and perhaps uh, you know make uh, make a decent living out of this um, so there are a, a, a couple of um, of questions really or points that um, I um, a long time ago was in New Zealand and in Auckland uh, there is a center for Maori crafts and um, tourists can come and watch uh, craftsmen making things, um, particularly carpentry in, in this case. Um, but uh, that seemed to me quite important because um, 
in, in both um, Kampala and in Cairo, um, those are tourist hubs and uh, that kind of, uh, of, of center or a place to come um, should be on the tourist map, so to speak. Um, and then um, another thing, uh, a former student um, that, uh, that I worked with uh, from Zambia, um, he was a musician um, and uh, a, uh, he was a Bemba and his vision was to have older people, uh, retired people come to a culture center and um, share their knowledge and train up um, new crafts, craftsmen, uh, in this case, in, in the making of musical instruments. Um, again, you get this feeling of a center where people could visit and watch um, uh, the old um, crafts being shared and uh, buy um, from a chosen craftsman um, uh, something that, uh, that you would like. So just uh, points there. Um... Can I comment? Please, yeah. Um, okay, as for tourism, um, uh, I, I need to differentiate between manufacturing and or, or creative industry or like let's call handicraft or artisanal products and crafts at risk. Um, we work with crafts at risk and we work with other crafts that are not in risk. Um, the, the, the crafts are originally at risk uh, partially of course because of massive industrialization that turned them which is fine where we cannot all like uh, live uh, dress uh, um, like furnish our homes with 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 um, like handcrafted products but uh, it was mainly uh, dying because of the massive industrialization and that's why it turned into a niche product or it turned into a luxury product or it turned into a conscious product that people would love to buy to because they know the story and because they know they've impacted some families or it turned into a unique production that people buy to when they have the purchase power so in Egypt unfortunately uh, it turned into a touristic product uh, traditional uh, uh, production turned into touristic production. And that was one of the main reasons why it is now at risk. Because uh, b before that, we used to, like from the inlay production, inlay that we, we do, inlay of copper, inlay of uh, bone, inlay of mother of pearl on wood, for example, that used to be used in furniture. But when it turned into tourism, uh, touristic products it, it it it's now only souvenirs it's like jewelry boxes small jewelry boxes that can uh, that are small so they can be shipped that are cheap so they can uh, be bought in quantities like cheap souvenirs and and with tourism they go and they don't come back so if there is a problem they don't come back to it uh, there is no product innovation like uh, so actually tourism was one of the main factors why uh, Egyptian uh, uh, artisanal traditional products are now at risk, but of course tourism is still. I can, of course, I cannot like. For example, some of our best uh, clients now are the Egyptian, the Grand Egyptian Museum, the Civilization Museum. I mean, we cannot really deny that sector. It's important and it's a good buyer, but we should never uh, rely on it. Uh, because it was actually the, the main, um, actually also when we have any problems in Egypt, either COVID, either revolution, either like any terrorist, terrorist attack, tourism stops and then people lose jobs. It's actually like, yeah, yeah. so uh, tourism, uh, but yet of course we have some examples of touristic uh, um, uh, applications where uh, some workshops are, uh, inside the touristic route so people can see the artisans working. That's for the first um, tourism related thing. The, the, the se second thing is about the, the elderly people. It's actually, yes, it's actually an amazing, we were talking about it today in my office. It was, it's actually an amazing uh, thing to work on. And uh, yes, they still have the power. They want to give, they want to give uh, seated. They want to give, uh, you know, like they, they can, they are an amazing uh, segment that we also can uh, can target, uh, but we cannot target them with 
uh, the, um, the crafts at risk. <laughs> Again, we can target them, uh, we can work with them with, with carpentry, with um, textile, with beading, with embroidery, um, with whatever is easy to work on in their own homes or in their own uh, facilities. But uh, we cannot work with them in, um, or a maker space even, but not uh, with um, an oven of, uh, of glass or um, we do hand blown glass. It requires a, a, a lot of, um, it, 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 it's, the hang, that's why the handicrafts are dying because it's still not yet developed to be worked at, at uh, a very safe environment where safety, um, Goggles are provided where um, the space is, is, is well equipped and the craftsmanship that are dying are very, 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 uh, um, it takes very long to learn. It, 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 it cannot be learned um, at uh, an older age. So some crafts can work with elderly people, but some other crafts, uh, we have to start from a young age. It takes years to be a master of a craft. I'm sure. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I also found it really interesting what you said about the tourism changing the nature of the crafts. Um, that's that's fascinating. Thank you, Nan. Um, um, Geraldine, you've had your hand up um, for a moment, so I am going to come to you next. But I first just wanted to highlight that Ronald has put a link in the chat um, to a needs assessment, um, which I hope you'll say a few more words about for us in a, in a minute. Geraldine, over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. Yeah, I have to agree. This has been incredibly insightful and interesting to listen to. Thank you also so much, Rania, for those uh, reflections. That was There was a, a lot of learnings in what you just shared. I just wanted to share briefly from a German and European perspective that I think this is an incredibly important and very timely topic. So in Germany, there's always been a quite strong valuation of specialized handicrafts and additional traits. You can, as you just said, Renia, like there's um, a lot of studies involved in qualification to get what is called a master certificate. And then people with that often seen at the same sort of um, job level as doctors or lawyers. And, and that's something very valued traditionally in German society. But I think it's especially also now um, um, becoming even more visible. The relevance of these skills in our societies is we're all dealing with the new effects of generative AI and what this means for sort of so-called white collar jobs. People are finally realizing that we've had a completely misled discussion when it comes to automation of labor because all artisanal and craft jobs require hardware, require specialized robots if they would ever exist to take over those traits. And that's way more expensive and way more difficult to create those than um, yeah, replacing somebody writing code or replacing somebody writing speeches, all those things. So there's a lot of discussion picking up around that at the minute. So very timely. And also there's a lot of new traction on a European level. We unfortunately didn't get a call funded, but are gonna reapply for it because we did get thankfully pretty good marks on an application um, for a new horizon call that was opened last year on digitization of heritage crafts. So these sort of traditional heritage crafts, which are just dying out also in many European countries, there's a new focus on how to support those and give them new life through digital technologies, whether that's like we connected with uh, Romanian uh, fashion communities, for instance, looking at how to work with yeah, 3D designs to support their artisans, but also in terms of material innovation and creation. So there's a lot happening in that area at the moment. And and also hopefully future sort of um, funding opportunities for projects that are really involving this intersection of makers and artisans. So we'll keep our eye open for those as well. Brilliant, thank you so much, Geraldine. Yeah, that's um, that's a helpful reminder of the, the parallels with the conversations that are happening at the moment um, about AI. Um, got a number of people with their hands up now. Um, Mustafa, I'm going to come to you next, um, if you'd like to, to share your perspective with us. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Yes, so I think uh, all what uh, we've been saying on the call is actually true when it comes to working with artisans and then people willing to learn artisanship. It is not different here in Ghana as well. Over the past few years, as 
have also been in the space. But uh, in Ghana, one thing that uh, we also encounter when it comes to people learning this artisanship work, for instance, plumbing, carpentry, uh, block laying, POP, home decor, it's actually very difficult to see a lot of people subscribing into it. So over the, over the past few years, it was actually a very big challenge. You, you barely see people even going to technical schools to go and learn uh, TVET sort of education. But the government actually has implemented a lot of policies and then pushing for this. And then there, are, there have been a dramatic change in it. I have happened to be in the space for some time now, for about six or seven years running. And uh, one thing that was that convinced me, that made me realize how difficult it was for people to learn was the time it takes for one to learn a certain skill. So, for instance, you take carpentry or woodwork. Uh, informally in Ghana here, people have to go through up to about three years before they come out and also try to find jobs. Now, there was a time we enrolled, we started this kind of training whereby we have a sort of a very short time that we can use to train people. So we started off with uh, epoxy flooring where we train people with only two days on how to floor epoxy. And we make sure the first day is for theory. The following day, the second day, we find a contract and then we send all the trainees there and then we work all together that day. So within this short time, people were actually getting the skill. So we could get a lot of people to participate to actually learn the skill. So there was this drastic change and the desire of people to actually enroll in some of these courses. Uh, along the line, we started biofuel, biodigesters training, which was also three days training, which could, was actually formally learned for like about three years or so. But we reduced the time span to about some few days so people can actually acquire the skills. So they were wondering, okay, could we actually get this skill within this few uh, short time? We said yes, because I, kn I knew how the work is done. Within some few years, it was all over the place. People started organizing for trainings. Like it, it just exploded in t on TVs. You could hear epoxy training going on, biodigester training going on, two days, three days. Now it has even gone beyond that into solar installations. So it's, it has actually changed the narrative of how people are now uh, learning, entering into the space of uh, artisanship. It has increased the number of people actually learn. But the problem lies is, the, where the problem lies is, now it's still, they still finish and then come out and look for jobs. That's, that's my problem. Even in traditional universities, you see someone goes to a technical school, learn electrical works, but then the person comes and then still want to look for a job in a company or something. It's becoming very difficult for people to actually set up their own businesses. So that is one problem I've actually seen because over the years, years to me looking for jobs. So, so I, I think your connection is cutting a bit, Mustafa. Yes, hello. Hello? Yes, yes, it was a, a call that came through. Yeah, so that's one re, uh, one thing about, uh, that's one main purpose why we set up our maker spaces to actually put, uh, bring people in here, get them hands-on training within a very short time so that they could get some of these goals. And then we try to also incorporate a business model aspect of things. So, they don't learn the trade and go out and still look for jobs because it's that actually doesn't put a good picture out there for those who want to come in and also continue the trade. I have had opportunity to travel almost the entire country. And uh, I think 
from the southern the southern part of the country and then the northern part of the country how things are done are very different you come to the northern area you see people actually entering into craft making because i see a lot of people who who work into the blacks uh, with the blacksmiths they are able to produce some agri, agri tools like hoes pickaxes and other stuff now you move all the way to the northeastern parts of the country you see people, children producing baskets, weaving baskets, weaving hats, and then they are into this craft works. A lot of people, you come to the Upper West region, you see a lot of children into weaving fabrics, okay? So it is actually, here we don't actually have that problem for now. The problem we have is when people finish learning the skill, what happens next? So that is what we are also working on to see how best we can change this situation. Yes. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, there are a couple more hands up, but I would just like to come back to Ronald first um, for a moment. Um, Ronald, if there are any comments you want to make on what Mustafa was saying, perhaps about the, the regional differences um, or about the challenges of what people do when they finish training. Um, anything from your experiences? Uh, yeah. I would say, um, especially during trainings, there are a lot of organizations that do trainings, but then the problem I think would be sustainability of these programs because most of the most of them, like after the training, then what next? And um, for the poem that I shared, that's why instead of us just coming up with programs, we first conduct a needs assessment. So all uh, so if you look through all the questions. Uh, that's like a profile of every cottage industry that we come across within the community. We have like a, a network of agents that we roll out to go and identify where these artisans are in the community. So based off the challenges that these guys have, because uh, for example, initially we, we first did like financial literacy trainings. That was like the basic, but you find that there are some artisans that don't really need it. They have passed that stage and maybe they need programs that uh, product development trainings that will help them refine their products or they need asset-based finances uh, or they need market and where we organize like monthly markets here at Motive. So um, I would say, uh, it's it's pretty much the demographic may change a bit, but um, we learn artists and makes products. I think it it's somehow the same. I would say yeah, yeah it, would, it would be the same, but the same time different because there are a lot of factors that you have to consider, uh, like the governance. For example, local leaders are rooting for manufacturing right now in Uganda, so I would say that maybe it's different from other regions. Uh, where local leaders are not looking towards that direction. Maybe they are more into agriculture. So such such dynamics, I think, change it a bit within the regions. Yeah, yeah that's that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, Ronald Sadsi, could we come to you next, please? Okay, uh, thanks, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So yeah, uh, I think what I have is basically more of a question for Rania. So when she was like presenting, she talked about uh, uh, the, the young generation not being interested in the traditional crafts of like e in Egypt. So my question is, um, is there an effort through your program to kind of make uh, the, the traditional crafts craftsmanship? Maybe exciting for the young for the younger generation because at the end of the day, uh, people who kind of do something that's kind of really exciting for them. And the, re the reason why people are excited for for, for things is, is quite different. Some people maybe they have a passion for something, or some people maybe see a financial benefit for something. So my question is, are you kind of like uh, trying to deliberately make it exciting for them? Maybe see, uh, making them see how they can benefit from these skills financially or just trying to incorporate some tech so that it can be fun for them to to take part in those in, in those, like in learning those skills and maybe gaining those skills and using them um, um uh, yes of, i mean of course this is our mm, mm, it's it's not only make them excited about it i mean our main job is not only to empower um, our artisan community economically but mainly socially, our main job is to change the perception of um, artisan. 
like Geraldine has said, like Mustafa has said, like, like Ronald has said from the beginning. Uh, now the whole world is 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 going through that change where uh, creative industries are now uh, highly appreciated and are now in a like in a bigger demand. But uh, that still has only affected the the white scholars, like the the more educated people. Um, in Egypt, uh, yes, we have a big movement of people with the white collar jobs, uh, of uh, of uh, actually women with high income <laughs> that are turning now into um, uh, creating their own brands and doing their own work. Uh, but when we're talking about decent, uh, creating decent jobs for uh, youth, general youth of Egypt, um, uh, or for uh, you know like. Yeah, for general youth in Egypt who don't still have huge access to uh, the world or huge access to uh, resources in general, that's when it becomes very uh, uh, difficult. How we try to do this is, as I said, by trying to change social perception. Uh, this is uh, through the media and through all, you know, like the different social media channels, through doing interviews with them, through uh, like highlighting them, putting them in light of putting them you know like putting the spot on them as well as through offering them study tours uh travel opportunities for example we only once uh took our artisans not uh the the young kids not the ones we think, but our artisans to a study tour in a coastal city in egypt and for us the main uh intention was for them to learn more about quality and safety from a well-equipped um, uh, furniture uh, factory. But it turned out that just taking them out of the city, putting them in an hotel, feeding them feeding them nicely, treating them like we treat ourselves when we go anywhere in an, any program, that changed the world for them. Now I'm a very like reputable person Don't in the fuck community out. of artisans just because we spent some money on... Uh, of offering them good uh, food, good lodging, um, and they they made a network out of themselves as well. It was like oh, Jamal, I found an English class. It was amazing. Uh, so offering them just what other well resourced people are offered makes the whole difference, and that's when we're talking about uh, the makers, but also for us the clients. If the clients, if we want it to be exciting for young clients, we are we're trying to offer design tools on our website um, and and how to uh, to engage the clients in the design process or how to engage the, the the clients in the in the story of the making itself and how difficult it is or how long time it takes, uh, what kind of material they want, what kind of uh, colors, what kind of cuts. So this is also another uh, way to engage the youth, the clients of them. Uh, to buy uh, more uh, artisanal products, uh, uh, and I would like to also to um, to say something about Geraldine' comment: AI and digital heritage uh, transformation. Again, yes, uh, the world is. Uh, that's why we're having more demand than supply now in Egypt. We literally have more demand on uh, uh, high quality um, handicrafts rather than the supply. The supply is still not able to meet the demand, and it's high quality. Yeah. It of course needs to be highly of high quality. Um, uh, so yes, AI can uh, uh, like it's easier to replace a coder than to replace a carpenter or a metal worker or a woman doing embroidery at home. Um, but uh, it's it's not yet easy to create jobs for the masses. Uh, one big difference between Europe and Africa is the younger generation. We have, we have. I don't even remember the the the, the, the statistic, but we have maybe sixty five percent or seventy five percent of our population is uh, younger than twenty five. So uh, creating decent jobs for young people um, needs uh, a lot of capital, and AI is such um, a threat. And yes, it's a it's a window to uh, to create jobs uh, in in creative industry. But it also, uh, when it comes to NFTs or when it comes to turning digital um, heritage 
to, comes into turning heritage or, or artisanal heritage into digital format. Uh, I had this client from the US who's printing uh, traditional patterns of embroidery, of basketry, of weaving, of inlay, any pattern of any craft, printing it on, on lifestyle products. And that was, uh, okay, let's do that. Maybe we can send you high picture, high, um, high resolution pictures for uh, your patterns to print it on other um, uh, materials. And then it turned out, and she was trying to convince me, yeah, of course, the money will go whenever we have a client, the like part of the money will go to the community that made it first or the community that owned the design. But it turned out it's mainly NFT and she didn't even talk about it. She's going to own the design and, 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 and buy it. And she didn't even talk about NFT. So transforming digital heritage into digital heritage, I think it has lots of... Uh, Threats, of course, it has lots of opportunities, but it, it also has lots of threats to uh, countries that doesn't have enough technological advancement or enough um, access to uh, international markets or to fintech or to uh, or that is not aging, that has a, a huge uh, population of younger people that need real like real jobs to 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 make earning out of it. So yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to say. Yeah, that, that's a super important point. I think the the issue about like the privatization of, of indigenous knowledge is is it's a huge risk. Um, it's it's definitely something that needs to be approached with great care. Um, Martin, I was going to come to you to um, to bring in some of your experience working with with artisans in Kenya. All right, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to see a lot of people whom I have not seen for a long time, like Ronald. Yeah, um, I hope I'm, I'm loud enough. Um, uh, actually, I can say Africa. Um, Africa has been focusing more on, on um, not really focusing on, but people, a lot of African people have taken advantage of informal manufacturing, which in Kenya we call Juakali and many other Africans are also calling it different names. Um, this is because the traditional industries were very expensive to establish and all that. And then there were a lot of gaps which people needed to fill in. But now um, there has been a gap between the guys who are working in this space, because majorly they are guys from Tibet institutions. And uh, they also work with a tag of, can I call it a tag of inferiority? They feel that they are not learned enough to, to do things. Uh, so if you go to those spaces, they feel a little bit having low self-esteem. But I want to also echo the part we, where um, Rania talked about um, the learning. A lot of young people want quick money. In Africa, a lot of them want, want quick money. I can assure you in Kenya, we use motorbikes a lot and nobody will, people don't want to sit in spaces for long because he can learn how to ride a motorbike in, in 30 minutes or one hour. And then the next minute he can get somebody to carry and, and, and get a few coins. So if you take them to learn a skill for some time, it's, it's, it's a challenging. Um, Recently, we, we were doing a program which we called Juakali Plus. Um, in our initial approach, we had some conversation and we thought the challenges they have is about the product quality, about branding and all that. But when we got and had first session with them, we came up with an approach called Gumzo Workshops, where we go and sit with them. Because one thing, uh, if you are not funded, like uh, Rania was saying, you take them to a, a nice hotel and do all those other things. If you don't have that kind of funding and you want to take them away from their working space to somewhere else, none of them will come. And that is how we designed um, our workshop called Gumzo Workshops, where we go within their workshops and have conversations with them. And during that time, we learned that they lack a lot of information. And um, I was surprised when they were telling me that even the government fear to go there. Actually, the, the taxation guys, uh, Kenya Revenue Authority, do not go to their space because government don't care about them. And so 
they can't penetrate them. So um, for, for the period that we've worked, we've realized that they have been operating in a space where they have, uh, um, they, there's a lot of information gap, which, which they don't have, and they are willing to, to know, but also they have the priority of getting money first. So that is a big hindrance because when you want to take them for a session, they calculate how much would I be making by that time. So if you are able to pay them for that much, then they are able to listen. So they, they accept that they have a gap, they want to learn, but they have their needs which they have to meet. So their needs come uh, before the, 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 the learning. Then lastly, also I want to say that about traditional craft. Um, in Kenya, actually, I can say that um, Kenya imports almost 90%. And, and this is where we were basing our, our conversation because we were feeling like if Kenya is importing so much and we have the Akali sector, why, why are people not buying things from the, their space? We realize that people are giving them low, low, uh, low, low prices because the quality of their products are low. And if we want to discuss with them on how to improve this, we realize that they have more problems than just the product quality. So in Kenya, majority of people, we have a community called Maasai. So those are the only guys who are still maintaining the, the uh, traditional um, work, but the rest of others are trying to fabricate any other item, which otherwise they fabricate them without really uh, inputting a lot of engineering scale in it. They just look at how it looked like and then they can fabricate for you something like that. So we realized that there's also a great a skill mismatch between the university graduates and the TVET sector. And also a lot of TVET sector, TVET institutions, um, as much as they are, they were planned to be practical, but a lot of them are not very practical. There's a lot of theory in this space. So upon somebody graduating in the TVET, you cannot just transit them to work directly. They still need a lot of an apprenticeship. So basically what I can say is that the Juakani sector is a, is a big sector. Uh, um, it's a sector that if we find a way of working with them well, the, and, and help in improving the quality of the products, then we can see massive local manufacturing in a lot of spaces. But as per now, the manufacturing is done by, and, and also they are so scattered uh, in a way that you, you know, every person is doing their own things. But I, I want to also appreciate that we, there's also another center in Nairobi, which has also improved the quality of local manufacturing, but they still don't get enough support. They feel they are really abandoned. And trust me, through our program of Juakali Plus, we have made a lot of government uh, departments to start speaking with them because there was, there was that gap. The government doing their policies without really speaking with the Juakali artisans. Juakali artisans are also doing their things and um, our clients only go to them when they don't have enough money to buy the other imported products. I've been having even wars with our government asking them, why would you have your offices fitted with products which are imported? In fact, a lot of them are wooden, which can otherwise be done locally. And then somebody tells you it's policy. Then you, you ask yourself, what is the policy if the policy cannot think about the, their people? Why is it there? And, and so, there are a lot of issues. The government speak well. They speak, we want to do this, we want to do this. But then you look at the action. The action doesn't relate with the, with the talk. Even the, the development partners, a lot of them, right now, a lot of even um, international organizations have a department on hubs and all that. But then follow up and see if it, it, it translates to practicality. It's very little. So there's a lot of talk about a good direction, but there's very little which is done in, prep, in practicality. So basically to, to topic of today, I really like it because it really touches on uh, how we can tra transform this. Uh, Kenyan government is, is now um, charging very highly on importation of, of items. So you that is why you end up a lot of products are highly priced 
But then, so long as people cannot appreciate local purchase and buy from outside, then it only means that the people will continue becoming poor because the little money you collect, you send it outside to buy. And the people who are productive, I mean, young people who are at their productive age are not doing so much. And that is how they are now pushed to a space which is easy to penetrate, like riding motorbike and get money. But that is not very sustainable. So basically, that's what I can say. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. Thank you, Martin. I think it's um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that different speakers have highlighted the need to change um, the artisans' perceptions almost of themselves and develop their their confidence, um, and um, then also to change other people's perceptions of them and you know give them a voice to to government and things like that. Um, Rania, I saw you giving thumbs up and, and nodding at various times of what Martin was saying. Um, I just wanted to a give you a um, a chance to respond to anything in that, if there's anything you wanted to say, and then also to come on and ask you if you could just say a little bit about how your work with artisans is funded, whether it's funded by the revenue you earn through the social enterprise or whether it receives grant funding. Thank you. Uh, actually, yeah, I agree with every word that Martin has said. Every single word applies to Egypt as well. Um, uh, it's difficult, but it's working. I mean, it's not working on a, on a big max, but it's it's like we're trying. As long as there are awareness, as long as there are people who understand where the core problem is, there are always ways to to come up with a solution. How we're funded? This is something that um, uh, is is actually my main challenge. Uh, because again, we're doing something that's very difficult. It's not a main. It's not a mainstream thing. It's not uh, um, a new product. It's not. It's actually there are so many new products. We do new products, but it's not. A, uh, it's actually uh, working with very frustrating people. With very frustrated people, we're working with people that has have no hope, that have been tried to work like that have tried everything and lots of people try to help them but they are really like and they are actually called treasure human treasures but by unesco the artisans we work with are are called human treasures because they are carriers of heritage they are the only carriers of like the the knowledge so working with them is very difficult so what we're trying to do is just having a regular business generally speaking that's my aim in life is where to get to that equation where we're mainly funded by, by our profit but of course we uh, need uh, for, uh, like to do capacity building to do new products to do new designs to introduce new technologies to introduce whatever that can help us optimize the supply chain or make it better we need extra funding and this is when we try this is where our uh, uh, non-profit works because in Egypt, there is no legal uh, social enterprise. We have nothing called social enterprise um, in our legal system. Now we've just introduced something called a social enterprise, but it has to belong to a non-profit. It's not the vice versa. It's just now introduced through the Ministry of Solidarity, not through the, the, the general business uh, communities. It's not through the regulator of businesses. It's through uh, the non-profit regulator, not the business regulator. So um, uh, that's why we got a, a big funding to uh, to revitalize the inlay craft in Egypt by a foundation, a Swiss foundation. Uh, but it's very difficult having two businesses and running two businesses with two different mindsets. Um, having a donor, uh, my experience was very uh, difficult. Um, when you attract uh, uh, non-profit uh, uh, money, it's like an open invitation for people uh, to get corrupted. Um, they know it's no one's money. And um, it's actually taxpayer. I mean, like our money came from directly from the Swiss taxpayers money. Uh, so like uh, people here, oh my God, you have uh, funding. Yeah. So like consultants take a lot of money, freelancers. Of course, everyone deserves to be paid. But uh, corruption, um, it's not only a, mount, a, a matter of paying fairly. That's not what I mean. Of course, it's finally our opportunity to pay fairly. But um, 
uh, if there is not a very strong governance uh, system that holds uh, team members accountable, that holds accountant accountable, that holds project manager accountable, that has a strong monitoring uh, tools, uh, for me, it was a, a big deal where my own team uh, has gone corrupted, <laughs> unfortunately. So, so um, yeah, funding can be really tricky. It provides you with a great opportunity to grow. And actually, uh, in our situation, we really did, we, we worked mainly on product innovation. We now have a bigger portfolio of our own designs because we managed to pay for designs. We managed to pay for capacity building, like, like Martin was saying, if, if, if you are taking an artisan out of their own workshop, you have to pay them. He's not gonna learn something new if you're not gonna compensate him with the money that he would have spent in his workshop instead. They are paid by day, so you have to pay him. So of course, a regular business cannot do that. Uh, and this is one of the challenges uh, we're facing. Uh, and then when you pay him and you get a funding and he sees you have resources, when the funding is over and you're back to being a natural uh, business, like he deals with you in a different way. He thinks you're rich and he increases prices and you know, like uh, like you've supported him before and you offered them services. So now, like he takes it for granted. And now you want a good service in a fair price. It's like it came first for free. So now you 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 want um, something in return, but he's used to taking rather than giving. It's a very challenging dynamic. But yeah, we're we're working it out. Um, we're even like we have to work it out. We have to diversify our network of artisans. We have to have a substitute for each craft, even if they are like the only ones available. Um, we have to, that's what we're trying to do. And we're taking some awards from here and there that are small. They can fund a very small, for business. Business can only take small awards or, you know, like very small funding that can fund a specific um like very small part of a project, like a, a design competition, uh, a website creation, uh, content creation. So we try to uh, to do that, but it's very uh, difficult, but actually we're getting better at it. Like surprisingly, our business is growing. We've been like, now we actually have more demand than supply or have a bigger clientele base than our team. Um, now our main challenge is with our own internal team and how to create um, a sustainable team that can take the orders forward or take the market forward. It's always a, a problem of supply, not of the demand. So yeah, we're trying to balance it out. Yeah. Um, Ronald Dumaherwe, I wonder if I could come back to you. Do you recognize that dynamic that Rania was talking about with the uh, the difficulty of, of getting um, artisans to take time away from their normal work excuse me and then um them getting used to funded projects and not wanting to work with you in the same way once the funding has ended is that is any of that familiar to you yeah um it is quite familiar though the approach that we take uh so normally we get like grants to run um to run like different projects with these um, um, artisans. However, when it comes to uh, grants or financing, what we do is we provide asset-based finances. And so uh, you could find that someone in textiles needs this, say, an electric uh, sewing machine to improve their operations, or they've been using a manual sewing machine. So we find that that model is much better if they're able to get this um, asset-based finance and then they pay back slowly uh, than having let's say small grants that you send out to them in terms of operations and when they end they don't know what to do uh, so we are taking more of that approach and it's on it's not only for the uh, machines but then also raw materials let's say if uh, an artisan has an order which is beyond the capacity that they have they can get raw materials on, 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 on credit if they show proof of uh, order from a client. So this model is uh, more effective 
than um, having this a small grants that are issued out to artisans. Right. Okay. Yeah. And do you actually earn any revenue from doing that? Do you, um, or is that that's just a facility that you're oh. providing? Yeah, yeah. So we earn commissions. Uh, so once you give yeah. you an asset, yeah. we are yeah. Well, of course, we earn commissions off of it. As you're paying back, there is a markup that we add on that you pay back. Also within a stipulated time that we agree. So the, we have no fixed contracts. It depends on how your business has been operating and functioning. And based on that, you can say, um, okay, the, the sewing machine is this price and we are giving it to you, but we will add on a 10% markup on this. So that's the revenue we generate through commissions. Okay. And do yeah. you also take commissions on um, the items that are sold through your market and so on? We only take off those commissions when they showcase them. We have a showroom. So if you showcase your product within that showroom and we make the sale, because we handle the sales and marketing of your products, all you have to do is make the product and put in a showroom. We earn a commission of 10%. But if you're selling out the product at your business or anywhere else, no, we don't earn off, off of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Martin, I see you've got your hand up. Okay. Um... Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Is is there anybody who has tried a model of uh, shared machines and tools for the artisans? Um, for example, there are a center where artisans work, and then you just establish a space where every other artisan, whenever they want, then they can work with the tools in one central place. Actually, uh, that's the main project me and Omar are trying to uh, implement right now. That's exactly what we're trying to come up with. I reached out to him because generally innovation hubs or fab labs in Egypt are created um, around designers and around uh, highly uh, educated people or young people coming out of university looking to try new things or like white collars wanting to, uh, to uh, prototype. Uh, but uh, but but like the traditional communities of knowledge in uh, I don't know if everywhere is the same thing. I think it would still be the same. It's actually communities that people try to get out from, not in. It's not uh, an attractive community to move in. So so it's actually it's 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 an old uh, community that is for thousands of years, and and now it's not finding its. Uh, shine anymore it's like it's just been into deterioration and and um, it's a crime spot actually more than anything else for the government so what we're trying to do is which is very weird for not like not common in the mentality of uh, the egyptian um, um, developmental community in egypt is to bring an a fab lab inside the, um, this um, for, for the government this high risk community uh, because again, there are knowledge there that is not anywhere else, and it's not optimized. And because of lacking of resources and lack of uh, machinery and lack of uh, of prototyping uh, resources, uh, they they don't have their own um, uh, innovation. Um, they they cannot do innovation. They just do what's asked of them. They 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 do old products, but not new products. So that's mainly what we want to come up with. It's also hopefully to be an innovation hub where we can bring designers with, with, with artisans. Because again, this type of communities are not accessible by designers. Uh, like again, the cool women, the cool young and, and um, men and women graduating from high profile design schools, they cannot access, they cannot gain access to these communities. So this is something that we really want to work on I know it's going to be very challenging. I'm not sure if it's going to either work out at the end, but yes, this is something uh, I hope to implement, inshallah. Thank you. Um, I would really want to, to be keen about it because this is one thing which I've been thinking very strongly that probably can help solve the problem where um, a workshop is established within the space and it is run well, 
and everyone else whenever they want any tools because one of the reasons why a lot of work is not done well is probably the tool and also it's much easier for them now to learn when the workshop is within their space um i, I have a question for ronald I, I don't know if you've also tried virtual uh virtual marketing for 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 these guys um because you 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 spoke about uh you earn um, a commission when they display their their products within your showroom. Have you tried a virtual showroom? So, sorry, what was the last? Uh, you mean a virtual a virtual showroom? Yes. Um. So yeah, we haven't tried a virtual showroom but i would say it's in plans they have tried um, doing that but requires some personnel that we haven't yet been able to get to design one however for the shared uh, machinery of course we have like a whole warehouse um that is dedicated to sharing machines whereby makers can just come in and use the machines and then um come with their raw materials if they have them, work on the products, and then they take away their products. And uh, we are also trying to find ways on how we can create those centers where we have like the most needed, uh, let's say like three machines, let's say if it's in textiles, we can have like the most three needed machines based on um, people's opinions, the artisans, then they can just visit that center. And that center doesn't have to be something like any facility, it could be an existing cottage industry whereby someone uh, has enough space to accommodate these machines and then the people around them uh, can be able to come and use these machines uh yeah for, for the virtual showroom no we haven't we haven't yet uh, been able to implement that i have a question if some if, if you can allow me. what's the difference between a virtual showroom and an e-commerce oh. Yeah, from my understanding, I think a virtual showroom is more of uh, that requires um, argumented reality to have like some like you move in a showroom virtually where you see these products. So it requires some bit of um, what's the name of uh, I forgot the word virtual reality for you to be able to see yeah to move around the the, the showroom. But then for the is it worth it? Sorry, is it worth it? yeah it it's is turning for, uh, virtual i mean having a virtual showroom that's styled that's i mean like the experience would make it that much different with the people with the, with the clients i mean mm. too much technology i mean yeah i mean it 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 it, it, it needs a lot of money it needs a yeah, lot yeah. of investment is it worth it mm -hmm. no one tried I mean, it maybe, i mean here around maybe. Maybe uh, with me, what I meant too was basically an e-commerce because um, I'm, I was just looking at a situation where you might be focusing on physical space when you leave a lot of clients uh, online. So if you do an e-commerce, but I, I really wanted to call it virtual showroom to, 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 to link the, the physical to the, the other one, but you don't really need to walk through it because it might need yes. a lot of investment exactly we have an e-commerce and um we're looking to turn part of our office into a showroom and uh, yes hopefully we have our own stores one day but uh, and maybe we have a virtual showroom one day if the uh, technology is not that expensive Thank you very much. Um, Nan, you've had your hand up. I wonder if you come to you next. Yeah, uh, just a, a, a question, uh, because I'm not familiar with, uh, with the various um, uh, countries to that extent. Uh, we, we've taken this conversation towards high tech, uh, but I'm wondering about low tech. Um, in South Africa, we still have a very, very great um, percentage of our population that listen to the radio all the time. And uh, I'm wondering about um, uh, radio programs, um, you know, where people can phone in, ask questions um, that, uh, uh, you know, um, you could get the message out and attract um, people, clientele in that way. 
and, and allow me to say something about that. When when we did our, actually we, we, we called it stakeholders meeting, but it was basically um, it was basically a, a discussion where we were having panel discussions and we were making sure that the artisan is one of the panelists having discussions. And when that when we did that, instead of inviting national televisions and radios, we decided to use the local radio stations, which was speaking language to the environment because we wanted it to start in the locality. And that I, I strongly agree with you that the traditional radio, uh, because people, a lot of people still have a lot of trust in, in uh, local media. So if, if you take that direction, it also have a lot of impact because if you could be understanding our local language and I share with you the audio, the way it was three, it was it, on, on the news three times and how they were even discussing it. It was so amazing. In fact, with the radio guys, they were even saying, you know, these guys are now out here to help the Juakali artisans. So any Juakali artisan, you need to get out and meet these guys. They have a lot of, it was so nice that uh, later on, uh, I got a number of calls asking me, how is this, how is this? So I, I think that is also one of the areas that should be looked into. Thank you for that, Martin. Does anyone else want to come in on the radio idea? No, okay. Um, there was, a, I'm just scrolling through the chat. It was a message that I wanted to pick up um, on um, uh, Dawson um, Sumange. Um, I apologize if I said your name wrong, but it says that you've come up with a new model around training. I wonder if you'd just like to share a little bit of information about that with us, please. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm Dawson from Tanzania. I think uh, my friend uh, Martin, I've tried to share from Kenya. It is the same challenge what is being uh, experienced in Tanzania. Uh, so we in Tanzania, after this comes such a challenge, we saw that uh, many youth guys, uh, they have interest, they have skills, they have gone to technical school, technical schools, but still they don't use such a skills. Yeah, in, in street, they may now become as big as some dependent, depending on their parents, but still they have gone to school, they have been yeah, sent to technical schools. So what we saw is that uh, it's better for us to come up with a, another model that uh, uh, young boys, women, or girls, as, as I say, they get term training. While getting training, they are also getting paid with what they do. It's like something like motivation, but they become also trained, given some uh, business skills that, okay, the smaller money you get, if you save, you can use it to buy some working tools uh, that can help you after graduating. Yeah, so there are some can afford, but some cannot. And if it reaches the time of graduation and they have not uh, accumulated the money, which is enough to buy uh, working tools, uh, at home, so we allow them to continue working as like uh, something like an apprenticeship. Yeah, so they, they become there working, making support, even make, I mean, supporting in terms of training others. They become mentors for those who are new ones. Yeah, so it's, the model is like that. So there you can find, we, we found that some, uh, they become now self dependent, even opening another sentence or some. Uh, says uh, businesses that help others within the same model. But we as uh, an organization, we, we go ahead looking on them. How are they going on? Yeah, supporting them in terms of uh, skills, network, especially market. And uh, as uh, our friends have tried to, to, to share about the challenge of market. Yeah, it's a challenge, but the design process, networking, whom to say, I mean, market segmentation, where to send the product. Yeah, we start communicating, even themselves asking what to do. Yeah, and even today, of course, I can say there is another organization we are working with. Yeah, there is a multi partnership pro uh, project. We had one tour to AdSense today. We saw the same challenge. Uh, 
those artisans that are, are trying to mobilize themselves and start working together. One of the challenges they said is like they are trying to, they learn once, they get one skills. After working, they see not paying, then decide to go to another option. Yeah, for example, we go to one person who studied with the electrical engineer, I mean, a technician. Before was an electrical technician, then left that, that job, then he went to soap making. Then after seeing the materials for making soap not available, already shifted to shoe making, you see? So this is a little, still going on, it's like a, a challenge now, you see? And because of they don't have who to mobilize them, whom to, to bring them in one uh, unit, like, okay, you need to do this, this. So I think uh, it's like uh, there, we need a lot to do to make these young boys and women come up with something uh, productive, especially for self-employment. Yeah, so just to say, uh, supporting young, young boys and men is a, is a bit a challenge. And this because of the background, uh, we as uh, say African countries, how we are, especially from family levels, because all these challenges we see is because our background, uh, we don't have let's say support. Yeah, from the government, yeah, private institutions that are well established. So I think like uh, motivated guys like us, now we are together, it's time to, to come up like what I'm saying, especially to start like something on job technical training centers that we mobilize those youth, especially can be graduate, have degrees, something like that. If they, they're interested in technical training, yeah, giving them the opportunity to, to learn, but still to make some tools and try to teach them how to get to the market. Yeah, after seeing that they are competent enough, now we can say, okay, and they have tools. They can go and have safe employment, and even try to mend others. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Darson, for, for sharing that. Um, yeah. We are gonna have to wrap up in the next five minutes or so. Um, I did just want to briefly come back to each of our featured speakers and just ask if there's anything else that you'd like to, to share with us, um, any any parting messages or advice for anybody else who's listening, thinking of, of trying to do more work with artisans in their countries. Rania, to you first, please. Um, um, yeah, like I think, yeah, how to, um, for, 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 I mean, for me, because I work with so many uh, crafts, so there are women crafts, there are men crafts, how to include women in the supply chain of men, because generally the men crafts are more expensive. Like the women crafts are mainly about beading, basketry, weaving, uh, embroidery. Uh, so they are mainly working with textile, so it's uh, cheaper. While the crafts dominated by men are uh, glass, uh, metal, uh, iron, uh, wood, uh, um, stones. So um, yeah, for us, uh, how to include women in the supply chain of men dominating the um, uh, uh, crafts are important, as well as how to incorporate or or bring the Fab Lab uh, movement or the Fab Lab makers uh, 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 movement or whatever into the traditional uh, supply chain of uh, the the crafts without losing the identity of the craftsmanship without with 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 like prototyping tools with helping how to bring the the designers and the the like the the newly the the well exposed uh, people to 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 market and its needs to the um, the, the 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 creative sector of traditional handicrafts because we all know that the world now is moving towards a more unique production production with story production with heart conscious production and i don't even remember your question so now i'm just talking and i don't know what uh, how i like uh, what did you want me to talk about I was basically asking you for any final closing thoughts and i think the uh i think that yeah, yeah. Given us maybe optimizing really the value chain to think, to think about. I want yeah. to optimize the value chain of the production because uh, some of our uh, products take up to 12 workshops to work on and how to uh, maybe, um, yes, like we're working with some extreme uh, 
Some other products that are also uh, highly at risk are only made in one workshop, like blown glass, for example. But with the inlay, uh, we sometimes go to more than 12 workshops. So how to uh, optimize on the supply chain and still support the informal sector and support the owners of workshops. If I say 12 workshops, it means 12 men. It, like the workshop are mainly one person or maximum two people. So how to support uh, the traditional supply chain and how to um, make it better is, um, is, is one of our main targets. And of course, how to transfer the knowledge and create a new generation of artisans that can take the knowledge uh, forward. Of course. Thank you so much. Thanks for those closing words, Rania. And uh, Ronald, um, if I could just come to you for any any final thoughts, anything you'd like to, to share with us or emphasize, please. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, I believe with the current trends that are going on, it's clear that manufacturing is now being, is championing our country based on the policies and uh, the, 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 the taxes they are putting on imported products. So it's uh, really good grounds for creatives and artisans to propel uh, the creation of their products. I don't know for other regions or countries, but at least for Uganda, I'm certain and I'm aware that uh, there is this whole movement about local manufacturing and production. So, and uh, of course for, for this, small cottage industries to be to push forward i uh, will need a way on how we can decentralize manufacturing and be able to support them uh, to be able to stand out in the crowd versus like large factories that have been in existence uh, for a number of years so yeah um it is really good business for um the artisans especially in the fields of textiles, uh, crafts, woodwork, metalwork, uh, art. Uh, it's really going to be booming. And within the next five to 10 years, uh, yeah, their livelihood, there'll be a creation of a lot of new jobs for youth. And uh, it's going to be more, more, actually more parents are going to bring their kids also to join the industry, enhance their skills, in contrast to what we used to see, whereby uh, our artisan, an artisan, we considered someone old, they are near retirement age, they are seated somewhere, uh, they are sewing, they're just passing time, but things have changed now, and uh, more youth are being lured into, into this sector. So it's really, um, it's really exciting time, especially for me that I work with creatives, it's, um, it's quite exciting, yeah. You can always reach out to me if you're interested in decentralized manufacturing and um, yeah, I'll be happy to share what I know or what I've experienced. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ronald. Um, and it's very nice to end on a note of optimism there about the, the young people coming into the, the crafts and, you know, the future of, of um, artisans. Um, yeah. So it just remains for me to say thank you again to, to both of our speakers from today, um, Rania Siddiq of Gabra in Egypt and Ronald Tumuherwe of Motive in Uganda. Thank you so much for, um, for talking to us about your work and your experiences. Thank you to all the participants who've shared your experiences, asked questions, made comments as well. Um, and the final notice is I just want to let you know that this is one of a series um, and we're running these conversations monthly on the third Wednesday of every month and um, next month on the 19th of April we'll be having the next episode which is going to focus on membership models um, as an element of the business models for, for maker spaces. So thank you all so much for joining today um, and have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.